Okay, the uh, title is a little bit more ambitious than what 20 minutes can present. Um, and also, um, you're looking at an artist who's not going to uh, show any images for this presentation. And that's an indication, perhaps, of a fatal strategy on my part. Um, so this is essentially a text-based work, but thinking about this, um, uh, uh, this subject, what's interesting for me is this area of um, identity and embodiment and uh, what constitutes interaction with, with, with social robotics. And um, I guess uh, I was <clears throat> very uneasy about accepting the word um, misbehaving robots, having thought about it, uh, but admitting that I was part of the organisers who came up with the title. Uh, and I want to, in fact, um, make a distinction between malfunctioning and misbehaving. Um, and I think although this might be a trivial semantic uh, kind of uh, distinction, uh, I think it's important in the, in the context in the context of, of social interaction. So for me, um, malfunctioning means effectively that uh, uh, a machine or a robot uh, can, uh, uh, through error, uh, not perform as it's programmed to do. Uh, the word misbehaving sort of suggests, though, that the robot is somewhat autonomous and somewhat intelligent. So to misbehave, in a way, is anthropomorphizing that robot. And um, I'm going to sort of uh, talk about this in, in terms of, uh, especially in terms of medical and military robots, although rescue robots would have been a, an area as well. Um, just to make a distinction between uh, the operational malfunctioning of a machine as opposed to uh, misbehaving machines, which suggest some kind of behavioural uh, states. Um, also, this uh, important thing to, to note that um, a malfunction uh, can occur in the absence of anyone. Uh, so a machine can malfunction in absence, uh, but again, uh, if a machine misbehaves, the only meaningfulness uh, in, in calling it uh, a misbehaviour or referring to any behaviour at all um, is that it has to happen with someone else, with someone uh, in the presence of that robot. Um, so we know now that machines are doing uh, increasingly dull, dirty and, and dangerous tasks. This is traditionally what robots do in, 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 instead of, um, of, of humans. And we can make smart, robust and reliable operational machines, uh, but that doesn't guarantee that they're not capable of making dumb decisions. So uh, a decision-making process depends not only on the operational automation or effectiveness of that machine, but for example on its uh, uh, social context and how that uh, decision is made uh, with an increasingly dynamic and unstable uh, uh, set of circumstances. So. I think that's sort of important to, to point out. And uh, now in reference to uh, medical robotics, uh, assistive and, and teleoperated uh, systems, uh, the Da Vinci surgery uh, robot is probably the, the best example of, of uh, what we see as, as high-tech assistive robotics in terms of surgery. Uh, in fact, uh, the surgeon doesn't have to be in proximity to the patient. Uh, the, the latest Da Vinci robot uh, has not only four extended arms, but arms that have uh, greater reach inside the human body. Um, it has endoscopic uh, uh, capabilities 
and it also enhances the, the, the surgeon's uh, vision in performing the operation. And the latest Da Vinci robot, in fact, uh, the, the arms are coupled to a rotating upper component of the robot, which means that the arms can uh, uh, have access to the body from, from, from various directions. Uh, and of course, at the end of these little extended arms, uh, there are different sorts of endoscopic uh, micro tools attached. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about uh, the, the uh, Da Vinci robot, of course, is that it's, um, it's, it's, it's very delicately interfaced to the surgeon's uh, 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 body. And of course, it assists in dampening uh, tremors that a surgeon might, uh, well, will, will have, especially when they're operating at a micro level. And, and last year, as you can see, over, over a half a million operations uh, were done using uh, robots. So, uh, I, although I could have spoken about how many times my robots have malfunctioned and how I've incorporated accidents in my robots, <laughs> Uh, with performances, and you'll see a lot of malfunctioning this evening um, with the sort of actual virtual system. Um, I guess what we're seeing here is, uh, you know, the necessity really for, for um, making these machines ever more reliable, um, especially in terms of interfacing uh, with, with, with humans. Um, and of course, uh, the human uh, surgeon doesn't have to be in the same place, they can perform the surgery uh, remotely. And uh, this notion of uh, going beyond telepresence to tele-existence, and by that, uh, that's a, a term derived from a, a, a Japanese roboticist, uh, Sasumi Tachi. Uh, in other words, um, uh, he's kind of gone beyond the, the Marvin Minsky idea of telepresence. So if, if the, the feedback loop I, I, is adequate enough, if uh, uh, the, the machine performs uh, what, the robot, uh, what the human operator intends, uh, so you get a, a spatial and psychological collapse between the human operator and, and, and the remote robot. Uh, so effectively, the robot becomes the end defector. Uh, for the, in this case, the surgeon, which, which is happening in proximity with the Da Vinci uh, surgery system. So in no way do we want to see a robot <coughs> like that um, misbehave or, or, or malfunction. And of course in, in, uh, in, in military use, of robots increasingly now uh, there are scenarios speculated about autonomous um, uh, robots that are armed and and probably dangerous um, and of course what what sort of uh, ethics are involved and interestingly uh, Joanne Mariner who's the Director of Terrorism and Counterterrorism Program at the Human Rights Watch, uh, in a way to partly justify the use of robots uh, in warfare, uh, says, uh, so I think the hope is that robots are not driven by fear, they're not driven by hatred, they're simply programmed. Um, in other words, uh, uh, robots might better discriminate and perhaps uh, are less likely to, to perform actions that humans might do, uh, you know, in a vengeful state. Uh, and then uh, the, 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 the interesting article out of the Wilson Quarterly by, by P.H. Uh, Singer, who kind of makes clear that the menagerie of, of drones now that are performing um, at different heights, uh, covering larger and smaller spaces and of course now with micro um, uh, vehicles, micro drones, not only can we do surveillance of a particular 
place we can do surveillance of a particular person and a microbot uh, drone might even take a blood sample while you're asleep. Um, so there are all sorts of uh, military and malicious possibilities with, with, uh, with these robots. Uh, so how do we uh, uh, go or justify uh, and, and what ethical concerns would there be when you uh, not only remote control uh, or remotely fly a drone, uh, but then decide that if the system is going to make um, uh, very fast uh, decisions in unpredictable situations, that you might automate it in some way. And if you do, then you might uh, imbue it with some kind of artificial intelligence. But if you are going to allow the robot to make these decisions, uh, then, uh, you know, what is going to sort of justify the decision that it takes? So there is a sort of a distinction to be made with auto an autonomous robot and a robot uh, with, a, you know, with what we would call a human-like agency. Um, these might be very simple distinctions philosophically, but I think uh, they're important to, to kind of um, interrogate this notion of uh, malfunctioning and misbehaving. Um, and, and of course, you know, robots might have uh, uh, incredible advantages if they're wired in to uh, uh, a, an internet uh, system that is generating data flows, immense data flows that it can tap, uh, that it can uh, incorporate, uh, and um, at both uh, military and medical levels. Uh, would be able to dynamically learn uh, sort of on the job. So uh, again, pointing out that uh, intelligent and autonomous robots may not be safe robots, speed of computation and reliability of response may not lead to an appropriate outcome in complex and changing situations. So of course in the theatre of war, we do accept collateral damage, you know, that's, that's such a, an ethical, uh, a dodgy uh, way of making an assessment uh, where innocents are, are killed in the process of pursuing a particular target. Um, uh, and sort of, in a sense, conversely, in a medical theatre, uh, it's a critical decision-making situation for saving the life of, of one particular uh, individual. So uh, decision making uh, becomes uh, really important uh, but again how do you imbue robots with not only a kind of a basic ethical approach to the jobs that they're performing uh, but, but also to be able to adjust to particular situations and, uh, and circumstances. So, um, just to, to summarise that, uh, obviously, in, especially with uh, rescue military and, and medical robots, we, ne we neither want them uh, to malfunction uh, nor to, to misbehave, uh, given that they might have some, some kind of um, agency as part of their operational uh, capabilities. And um, uh, I'm uh, presently the director of the Alternate Anatomy Lab, the labs at Curtin University. Uh, we have two research, uh, full-time research fellows in uh, Dr. Kristen Cruz and Dr. Nina Sellers. And we're sort of generally exploring not only the engineering of, 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 of novel uh, uh, biomimicked uh, machines, but also generally exploring issues of identity embodiment and agency. Um, we've got a 16 micron resolution 3D printer, uh, 3D scanners and uh, 6K cinema quality equipment uh, as part of our, of our facilities. 
Thank you very much. Thank you.